Okay. Um, just. So this chapter, chapter 13 is about product development, branding, and pricing strategies. So we're still on marketing, marketing chapter, right? Uh, what were the four P's of marketing? Somebody name the four P's of marketing to, for me. Four P's of marketing. Yes, Shana. Product, price, place, and promotion. Product, price, place, and promotion. So we got product development uh, uh, and, and pricing here, right? Uh, branding is kind of part of promotion too, so. Um, anyway, so this is all still part of marketing. So let's talk about new product development. These are the, according to the textbook, and these are kind of uh, over all the steps that, that you go through when you develop a new product. So at the beginning is you come up with ideas. How can you come up with ideas? So companies constantly do the, this when they want to come up with new products or new services, right? Um, uh, they, they can uh, brainstorm brainstorm new ideas, get employees together, or maybe brainstorm even with customers. You can have customer focus groups and so forth, right? Um, and then they think uh, think of, or you can think of ways to improve an existing product. We have an existing product. How can we improve it? What can we do to make it better, right? Um, so um, once you have a bunch of ideas, you screen the ideas. Not all ideas are great. Right. What makes an idea great or what makes an idea worth pursuing a little more? You kind of want to weed out those that are and not likely to ever hit the market. Right. Um, that are, or that are, that are impossible to create or that would be so expensive to create and people wouldn't pay, pay for it and so forth. Right. So ask yourself, will my target market benefit from this product? If it doesn't provide a benefit, people aren't going to buy it, right? Uh, and, and ask, can this product be competitive with similar products? So it doesn't have to be exactly the same product. It does, it can, products only have to be similar and kind of fulfill the similar functions, right? So uh, let's think about, uh, so there's something called substitute pro products. Um, instead of using one specific product, there's another product you can use by the competition, or there's a substitute product that you can use. A substitute product is different than the original product. Let's talk about somebody get, name a product that we all use. Give me a product we all use. iPhone or phone. Yeah, iPhone. Let's say iPhone. Oh, that's a hard one, actually. <laughs> Let's do another one. Let's not do iPhone. Let's not do something tech, something non-tech. Soap. Soap. Okay, soap. Good. So, uh, uh, so, soap in the shower, right? Or it doesn't matter. Hand soap. Let's say hand soap, right? Hand soap. So there are these bars of hand soap. So what what kind of uh, uh, brands are there? Dial. There's uh, what are the Dove. There's a. Uh, you know, the, all these uh, organic ones, the Whole Food brand and the, the Lush brands and all these things, right? All these soaps that you can put, you have a nice soap dish and then you put soap in it and you wash your hands, right? What's a substitute product for that? What is a, in, instead of using a soap bar, what can you, what else can you use to um, satisfy the same need, washing your hands? Instead of a bar of soap, what can you use? Pump. Liquid soap, that's right, pump. Uh, uh, what is it called? Um, um, there's a name for it. They don't call it liquid soap. They call it something else. What is it called? I call it liquid soap. Huh? I call it liquid soap. You call it, okay, let's call it liquid soap. Yeah. But you get it. That's a substitute product, right? And, 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 uh, you know, some, you don't only look at the competition. But you look at substitute products. Since you're developing something new here, there's no direct competition. So you have to look at other products that fulfill the need. But what does yours do to stand out? So in the past, probably at one point, there was no liquid soap, right? There were only soap bars. And then people started developing, having the idea, we can make this liquid, probably at some point, long, long time ago. And then they thought, well, will people, uh, what, what can we offer? that we can compete with the bar soap. What, what do you think, what are some of the things you can offer 
to compete with a bar soap when you first develop liquid soap. What's better about liquid soap, if anything? Yes. Doesn't create a mess, really. Yes, it doesn't create a mess, and you don't touch it until you use it. No, people aren't going to touch the same soap. Why? I think that's one of the biggest benefits. So that's probably I don't know how liquid soap developed or whatever, but I'm just giving an ex uh, giving it as an example since um, we had soap as an example, right? So. Um, can this product be competitive with similar products, right? Step three is product analysis. Determine uh, and determine the desired sale, sales price and assess the cost of production. So what, what do you want is, well, I would probably first look at how much is it gonna cost me to make this product and then uh, how much can I sell it for? You gotta have a margin, right? The cost of the product cannot be higher than the sales price. You have, to have, have to have a nice cushion in there uh, so you can pay your other operating expenses and everything, and then plus have some left over, right? And then the, you, develop, uh, um, you develop the product and you test it. Pro produce a virtual or conceptual prototype, get feedback from potential customers, right? You can do that by, by giving free samples and asking for feedback, by creating focus groups, by... Uh, um, uh, you know, if you have existing customers through your other products, have them try it out and so forth. So there are all kinds of ways to reach customers to give you feedback on, on new products, right? And then you test the marketplace product and select target markets and, and see, do you get any um, sales or what, what does your sales look like in those uh, select markets? And then virtual, rea virtual reality or simulated tools can help customers, right? Um, depending what you're selling. And then after that, if that's all, if go ahead, then you commercialize it. Introduce the product to the entire market, to your entire target market, and begin the rollout process, right? Any questions about product development, new product development? All right. So I think we did brief, briefly, product life cycle came up briefly, I think, in another lecture, did it? Or maybe it was a different class. Anyway, so every product has a life cycle. Um, the beginning, uh, and it affects sales and profits too, by the way, right? Which is kind of not directly parallel, but kind of goes in the same similar type of curve, right? But profits, of course, are obviously lower than sales. Um, but in the introductory phase, actually, you could even be below zero in the introductory phase. You introduce a new product, you're not really making any money in the introductory phase. You have to have a certain amount of sale to recover your investment and all that stuff before you can even make any profits, right? Uh, and then slowly you go into the growth phase where, you know, this is this now market that has really accepted this and more and more people are buying this new fancy liquid soap. Right. Um, and then uh, you go into a maturity phase where a lot of people are buying it. Right. Almost everybody has liquid soap in their bathroom now. And then at one point it declines. We still have liquid soap, right? But it does go into a declining stage. Right. So that means sales are slowing down and uh, we got to do something. What can you do when you go into the declining stage? Aaron, you can re-innovate. You can re-innovate, and of course, you don't really wait until the end and start re-innovating. As when a new product hit, you're already working hit the market. You're already working on your next product or next version, right? Like the iPhone, for example, they're already working. Who knows what version they're already working on? You know, 15 just came out. They're not going to wait till the end, till they stop selling 15 and then invent the next version. It's already there, you know, ready to be launched next year around September. Right. Um, but anyway, that's the product life cycle. There are certain decisions you need to make when you get into the decline stage. Stage. Do you want to keep the product by by uh, maybe um, re-innovating it? You know, adding some other features to it. Maybe you want to. You, maybe you can change it so you can tap into a different market. Uh, Maybe you can just let it die, right? So that's uh, decisions that companies make. Um, 
So you can extend the product life cycle. When it starts declining, these are the things you can do. You can lower the price, right? Um, and sometimes companies do that just to get rid of the inventory they have at hand. Sometimes they do it because they can still make good profits, right? So uh, you see that automobile discounts of, uh, you know, now the new models are coming out, the 2024 models are coming out. You can get a discount on 2023 models, right? Um, rebates and low interest loans, if it requires a loan such as a car loan, right? Um, create a new use. Um, Arm & Hammer baking soda um, was in the, I guess, at the end of the maturity stage and declining. And they created a new use saying you put it into the refrigerator as a deodorizer to eat away the smells that are created in the refrigerator. And then they started also saying, put it under the sink or we're next to your trash can and things like that, right? So they created a new, new use for it. Change the packaging for it too, right? Where you kind of open it a little bit and I guess you have to keep it open in, in the refrigerator to, to make it work, right? Find new markets. Home Depot and Lowe's tapped into the do-it-yourself market. Maybe in the old days, the way Home Depot was is, is contractors, builders bought there. And then they decided, oh, you know, we're going, uh, you know, our, we can extend our product life cycle or our sales. We can increase our sales really by tapping into the do-it-yourself market. And they can offer workshops and things like that, right? Um, use new labels or different container types. Coca-Cola has a six ounce bottles or eight ounce cans. Right? A lot of times you see that on the airplane, by the way, you see the smaller cans. But um, talking about Coca-Cola, we talked about earlier, yeah. it is not good for you. <laughs> Too much sugar, right? Even, even Diet Coke is, is probably not that good for you. It's just full of chemicals, right? Aspartame is not good for you, the fake sugar. Anyway, uh, or create a new vision. I don't know if this, is re this really works. This isn't your father's automobile campaign. You know, Oldsmobile had, has the image of old people drive this car. You all would like to have an Oldsmobile, anybody here? No, no way, right? Even I wouldn't want one, right? So, uh, but anyway, so they're trying, they're create, tapping, again, this way they're tapping into a new market, into the younger generation market. I don't know if they were successful with that or not, but um, it was a, you know, one way to try to extend the product life cycle. Next topic is product differentiation. The process of dis distinguishing a product from its competition. There's a lot of competition in consumer products, right? Uh, you go to a grocery store aisle. What is this? This is all, this is all uh, drinks, like juices, vitamin bars or whatever those are, I don't know, but uh, uh, how do you choose which one to buy? They all kind of look the same, maybe a little different shape of a bottle, different colors. Branding is probably important. Certain people um, prefer a certain brand over another, right? So, but there are other ways to differentiate yourself. Erin, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, you could do your packaging. You could make it a lot more appealing and prettier. Your bottles could be really beautiful. Um, you could market your product that it's like 100% fruit-based versus like, um, you know, processed. Great, great ideas. Yes, yes, very good. Um, next topic is consumer and business to business market. So uh, consumer products are purchased by households for personal consumption. Uh, traded in the consumer market. So, you know, what we buy, retail stores sell that, or we buy it online, right? What, what individuals use. Business to business products, sometimes called industrial products, are purchased by businesses for further processing, resale, or as supplies, right? So if I have a business, let's say I have a restaurant business, I have to buy actually the same products that consumers buy to make food, for example, I have to buy, uh, produce, I have to buy meat, I have to buy flour, I have to buy uh, cooking oils and all that stuff, but of course in larger quantities, right? So I buy it from a, uh, I don't buy it from a retail store. 
I don't go to a reach. I don't go to Safeway or Whole Foods and buy my supplies for my restaurant. They're usually wholesale restaurant wholesalers, right? So that's an example of of business to business, right? Uh, it's used as 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 a, as an ingredient in the food that I'm now going to sell to my customers, right? Um, and they're traded in, in business to business markets. Of course, there are products that have. Uh, um, that sell to both consumer and um, business markets. What kind of products would sell to both? I mean, almost everything. I mean, not almost everything, but a lot of products are sold to, um, you know, tech products are sold to businesses and consumers. Um, uh, food, uh, unprocessed food products such as flour, oils, coffee beans, and all that stuff is bought by consumers, but also by businesses. Um, which products are only bought by businesses? Which products are only traded in business to business markets? Something you wouldn't buy. Kevin, um, I think raw materials. Raw materials. Well, yeah, uh, steel. I'm not going to buy steel, right? Um, so um, anyway, so keep in mind the difference between consumer markets and business to business markets, right? And consumer products have different classifications. There are different products, convenience. Shopping, specialty, and unsought products. Let's give examples of each of these. Uh, convenience products, they are used very often and consumed quickly. What are some convenience products? Often sold at convenience markets. Items. Hmm? Items. What items, yeah? Items. I iTunes. No. Oh, I haven't thought of that. If yeah. you downloaded like a song from my team. Quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely conven uh, convenience, but you reuse it. You, you, you don't just consume it once quickly. That's, that's the difference, right? Something that you use in my candy bar, bottled water that you should never buy, by the way. Use a reusable. That's one way to, to uh, contribute to the decrease of, of uh, the trash we have in this world right but uh, but anyway sometimes we have to because of emergencies we need some clean drinking water right or cold water uh, but anyway so those are convenience products right um shopping products they are bought less frequently and require a little more effort and time for com uh, uh, compensation so um you know we maybe look around a little more now shop around a little bit what are some Shopping products. The word shopping kind of gives it away. You go shopping. Clothes. Clothes, yes, definitely. Clothes, shoes, uh, furniture, home decor. Home decor, yeah. Um, you know, things, like, uh, yeah, that's where you are going to shop around a little more. You're not standing at a, uh, you're not uh, pumping gas and going inside to buy a bottle of water real quick, and it doesn't matter if it's a dollar or a dollar twenty. But now you're really shopping around, right? Um, and then there's specialty product, high end or brand particular, where price is not important. Give me an example of specialty products. Price doesn't matter. Mm, what do you think? BMWs. BMWs. I don't know. It's old. I mean, high end, high end. Think of high end products. A Lamborghini. Private jet. <laughs> private jet. <laughs> yes. That's what I think. Ferrari. <laughs> uh, yeah, those kind of things. I mean, you know, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is designer purses, jewelry. <laughs> Right, I think those things, right? Uh, um, so, um, you know, where you just gotta have that brand, doesn't matter how much it's gonna cost. I just wanted to say, like, I think specialty products, like bespoke product, right? 
product that, as you say, like custom products, like you custom products, like for example, right? Let's say Bezos is trying to buy a yacht. Jeff Bezos is trying to buy a yacht. Yeah. Right? Yes. He's gonna have. It. He's gonna want it bespoke. Yes. Yeah, special. Yes. Now the price of that man was about billions of dollars. Doesn't matter at all. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I like that one. Yeah. And then there are unsought products, fill unexpected need, price is not important, things you weren't planning on buying. What could that be? Unexpected meanings to the doctors. Say that louder. Unexpected meanings to the doctors. Yes, you got to go to the doctors. You didn't plan on buying that you needed to buy this medicine. You got sick, you need Tylenol or some over-the-counter medicine even, right? It's an unsought product. You didn't look for it. Uh... No, it's not going to happen to any of us in the next 50 years, but somebody in our family is dying and we need to shop around for funeral services. Didn't expect that, right? Yeah. Your dog is sick and you need to put your dog to sleep. So things, emer kind of emergency, you know, usually they follow some kind of emergency, something you did not expect to happen. You're getting divorced, you're shopping for a divorce lawyer. Things like that, right? <laughs> All kinds of things that happen in life that you don't expect. And a lot of them involve um, that you have to now spend money on things you never thought you needed or you didn't expect to spend money on. Right? Uh, where often price is not important. So it depends, you know, if you hire an attorney, you will have to look at the price. They're very expensive. But uh, uh, in a way, price can be important. It depends on how much you can afford, let's say, funeral services, right? I mean, how much can you afford for that? Or, uh, you know, it's, you have to go by that. At, at one point, if we're not Jeff Bezos. Not everybody can afford anything they want, right? Yeah, so. Uh, questions about product classifications. All right. Branding is a name, term, symbol, or design that distinguishes a company and its products from all others. Uh, it's usually done as a trademark, right? Give me examples of a trademark, a name or a symbol or something like that. The Nike. The Nike swoosh, right? Mm -hmm. Just do it, yes. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, the oh. M for McDonald's, uh, any of the Apple, with the buy taken out for Apple computers or Apple products, I guess, right, yeah. Those are brand names, right? And and um, um, what do brand names fulfill? Uh, uniqueness, maybe? Uniqueness. You identify, oh, you know, you identify a product's maker. You know, unless it has the Nike swoosh on it, you know it's not made by Nike, right? Um, so um, recognition, uh, rec product recognition, you recognize products, um, Oh, you recognize the maker of the product. And, 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 and people a lot of times have preferred brands that they go for, right? So they will look for that brand, rec uh, brand when they go shopping. Again, this is one way to differentiate your product. If you have brand recognition and brand loyalty, where consumers recognize your brand and are loyal to your brand, they will look for your brand amongst all these other products that look very similar. So brand loyalty is uh, brand recognition, brand preference, and brand insistence. It is what it says. You recognize your brand, you prefer the brand, and you insist on buying that brand. Anybody have any products that they use where they, it has to be that brand? They prefer a certain brand. Apple. Apple. A lot of um, us probably prefer Apple products. What are the products? A lot of clothing brands, right, that we have preferences. Shoes, athletic shoes. Yeah. I just watched the movie um, Air. Or, you know about Air Jordans? Yeah, great movie, great movie. Yeah. It was all about how uh, Nike got him to uh, represent the brand. Yeah. So, um, What's the name of the movie? Air. I think it's called Air. Just look up movie about Air Jordans. It's it's on. I think it's free on um, 
Prime or Netflix, I don't remember. It's yeah, one of those streaming services. Yes. Um, I can say that I definitely have a preference for cars, which is BMW. I don't know Me why too. I'm just a BMW background. I like Benz. No. You like Benz? Uh, no. Mercedes Benz? Mercedes -Benz? No. Yeah. I, I had both. I, I had a Mercedes Benz and I had a BMW. I definitely prefer BMW. Yeah. <laughs> See? Yes. Can everybody listen to uh, Kevin's question? Aaron, Kevin has a question. So yeah. my question is, how how does a trade man or how can a trade mark affect uh, a company? For example, let's say a company started, right? But when they started, they didn't guys, have listen. They didn't have like a trademark, right? Mm -hmm. And now let's say they My bought a domain and, and logo and all that. And but now the company is big. Maybe someone saw a vision, right? And they went ahead. They, I'm, I'm asking because I really don't understand how trademarks work, right? And the person sees it, right? They trademark that name. How how can that how is that gonna affect the company? And so I'm not sure I understand your question. Okay, here. Yeah. I started company, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe because I didn't. Nobody have... knows you, right? You started company. I started company, mm -hmm. right? But then the company is public, right? Yeah. And someone somewhere sees that this is gonna go big. They believe it goes big, right? The same thing happens like in domain fishing. You find different ways to clone your domain or whatever. Mm -hmm. This happens, yeah, so, right? Mm -hmm. But now this is with identity. That person goes and. Uh, uh, do the thing, the the thing, um, trademark. Trade trademarks your your brand. Maybe the name or the logo. What happens when you are ready to do that, and then you find out that someone already did it? Oh well, uh, so there's a difference between trademark and and uh, and uh, 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 patents and things like that. I think you're talking about two different things. So ideas and 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 inventions and stuff. No, no, not you're that. You're just talking about the trademark. Why would somebody steal your trademark if you're not known? If nobody knows you? Okay. Yeah. So that that's one thing, right? Okay. I mean, that's. Uh, uh, but if you already use that, if you use that name first, and and you registered your trademark, which is recommended to do. But even if you haven't, if you have used that name and done business under that name as the first person, you own own that name okay. or trademark, right? Yeah. But but other than that, you know, small new company has some ideas. Nobody knows about this company. Nobody would be interested in stealing your trademark. But they might be interested in stealing your idea. Does that answer your question? Yes, take take my business law class. You should, yeah. I'll tell you right she now. Took it, yeah. I'll tell you right now. You go to USPTO, you Google search or you search if someone's got the trademark. Yes. You register your trademark, you check your domains, you register your yes, domains, you exactly. pay someone to host. Um, <laughs> yes, you know. She was a good student. Yeah. Um, but what I was going to say, you guys all know the brand Bucky's from Texas. Okay, so Bucky's is this like massive. Can you all have stop having side conversations? Or you have to share what you're talking about. <laughs> Would you share? I'll get back to you. Would you share what you're talking about? You really want to know? You really want to yeah. know? Yeah. heart? I'm just talking about uh, that shady GT6. <laughs> hey. Am I not? <laughs> it's being recorded. The shady GT6 is pretty yes. best one in March. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. 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 We're still arguing. We're still arguing. Right? <laughs> About which one? Isn't BMW better? Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, now let's get back. So Aaron went at, uh, had an example about a brand. Everybody else except Aaron, be quiet, please. Okay, so Bucky's is like this massive. Um, I'm going to sit you apart. I'm going to make you move. Eyes up here. And everybody close your laptops. Everybody close your laptops. Everybody close laptops, please. All right. And okay. phones away, right? Okay, now pay attention to Aaron, please. It's, a, it's this massive, like, um, petrol station convenience store in Texas, and he's got a chipmunk face, and as soon as you see the logo, you'll recognize him. And he does merch and everything, and it's absolutely ridiculous when you walk in there. So what happened was someone started, like, a um, shop in Mexico, but they called it Bookies, where they spelled it B-U-K-double-I. So Bucky's found out and like sued them and did everything they needed to do. Then there was a second one that started up, so then they did that as well. But um, 
if you just go look like it's easy to identify how they're like basically stealing their trademark without stealing their trademark but um what i think is really funny is someone has now started doing merch that does the book ease oh really <laughs> but i so what i want to know is how they can like sue them for doing the merch of, like it's crazy man well the, so here's the thing uh, um and, and we did cover that in the class too if they will look at is it confusingly similar where consumers might think oh this is this company right um are they in the same industry and things like that right uh just quickly and you might remember that from the business law class there was a um a starbucks location oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was called in la it was called dumb starbucks and everything was the same except everything had the word dumb dumb latte dumb cappuccino dumb, dumb croissant dumb d-u-m-b stupid right yeah yeah dumb Right. So, uh, what what would even motivate someone? For such a big... You'll find out. You'll find out. So, so Starbucks sued for trademark infringement, saying they're not allowed to use my trademark. But Starbucks lost because it was covered under something called parody law. Actually, the guy that opened the store was a comedian, right? And it was parody. You can make fun of people and use their trademark to make fun of them. You can do that. Uh, uh, obviously, that was not a Starbucks. Uh, so they won and they could keep the store open, but like maybe a year later, they closed because of, they got closed because of health code violations. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, that's just the star uh, um, story besides the point, right? Um, 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 yes. I have a question. Yes. What did you say? So, in terms of the, the health code violation, could it be that maybe Starbucks did something? And probably like um kind of um taint the image of this other company because I know that companies sometimes they go in like the infiltrate system and other companies like to um make give bad names. So to give... well, the, the 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 health code violation is health code. The the Department of Health Services usually the county goes. They get reported for doing something improperly. Uh, food I know, health, but what food is, but is it possible that maybe Starbucks, right? Could maybe send an employee to go do something and then they mess up things. I, I don't that... think so. I, I, I don't, I mean, yeah, of course it's possible, but I don't think they did that. It, it wasn't really. I mean, I guess I just want to know if that's legal. No, know? it's not. That would be illegal, of course. You can't do that, plant an employee in that company and purposely mess up. And no, no, that would be conspiracy. That would be. <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's just go on. So brand insistence is when you insist buying that brand. Brand awareness and brand association is brand awareness as you are aware of the brand doesn't necessarily mean you're buying their products, right? Uh, and brand association is you associate a brand with a certain image or a certain product or whatever, you know. So, uh, so somebody might never ever own a piece of Apple uh, device, no, never own an Apple device, but they will know what Apple is and they, they will associate Apple with tech stuff, right? Uh, uh, Macs and phones mostly, right? So that's, that's a brand association. Um, packaging is an important part, right? It, uh, it has different purposes. It contains pr and protects the products, uh, facilitates use or convenience. Uh, you know, some uh, think about a box of, um, Kleenex, you just rip it top and you take one out at a time and stuff. That's a package that's designed to facilitate easy use, right? Um, promotes the product, makes it stand out on the shelf where all the competitors are, right? And of course, it displays your brand to the package and affects the environment. A lot of companies are now um, uh, advertising that they're using recycled materials for their packaging or that their packaging is 100% recyclable, right? Um, questions about packaging? Yes, Kevin. It's probably a stupid question, but again, about corruption, that's how that happened in this top corporate company. Would it be? Is it possible? If, again, just scooters. Yeah. What if this company is just, it's easy to put it on label that we use this and that, right? We, we are 100 percent right oh of okay. course it's possible that companies lie okay yeah well, but then when they get caught then there's a lawsuit so if it's possible then and, why and, do people just really believe it every day well it, it, because it's regulated so it, it is regulated you know uh, for example you know when when organic products became popular 
people use even at the farmers market you cannot put organic unless you are certified organic right usda certified organic right the, but farmers market i think i don't know if that's usda or whatever but anyway you gotta have the certification if you have a certification then it's more believable right yeah but you know is it possible somebody still cheats? Of course it is, but you know, a lot of times they will get caught, right? And and they will get caught maybe by the competition. They will take buy one of those products and examine it and see if it was indeed this or not, right? Yeah. So uh, it's a huge risk to do that. Huge risk, right? Um, and of course, label is important. Labels on the uh, the label is on the package. They inform users or persuade users to buy. Be careful when you, you you see those nutritious facts. One of the things people forget is the serving size. If you buy a regular size can of soda, it usually has. Uh, I don't know if it still does, but it used to have serving size is two. In other uh, in other words, there are two per package, so it's all the the nutritious label is only for half of the soda. Although one person drinks the whole thing, or sometimes you buy something, it's you think it's for the whole package, but no, it's usually half the package, or sometimes even less. So pay attention to that, right? Some of this is regulated by law. You have to give this information. Yes, Kevin. It's about labels and yes. nutri nutrition facts. So when I watch, it's something weird that happened when I came to America, right? Mm -hmm. When I watch the news and like there's uh, an advertisement. I, I, I found that it's 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 always like they go and, and they warn you that you could get cancer from the same product that's supposed to cure headache. So why why does it happen like that in this country? So uh, what it is is you would have to consume huge amounts of that uh, uh, for you to um, no, no, but have the side effects. I'm saying what is it so important that they for example right there's a product it's supposed to take away code and they tell you this right but then the die, side die, effects die, die, die. <laughs> i know i know yeah. Yeah. Uh, i i think yeah. the point be, oh if, if this thing is gonna kill me yeah, yeah. Uh, because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i know it's like oh you you it helps you to cure this but you can get all of this like yes. might as well just commit suicide right yeah. you, including death it says yeah. at the end right yeah it's like a lot of them yeah and it's, it's, it's kind of comical and this is very very specific to the United States. <laughs> also, in other countries, uh, uh, drug companies do not advertise on TV. Yeah, is it because of the lawsuits? It is, it is, yeah. yeah. It's the lawsuits and the consumer consumers have the right to be informed and the right to be informed about everything about the product and because of the lawsuits, right? So, um, but that's very specific to the United States. It also has to do with how our healthcare industry operates, right? The fact that they can advertise on TV and, and, and things like that. You don't see that in other countries. Wait, what? You, that, you know, these big drug companies advertising their drugs on TV and then all that, you know, all the side effects and stuff like that. Yeah. You do, like back in South Africa, you are allowed to, but it's more like herbal medications and less serious. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something, when you come to see like America, it's the first thing you see, it's the weirdest thing ever. You're like, okay, cool drugs. And then it's just this yeah. like, a list, of <laughs> list of side effects. <laughs> Anyway, we we got to go a little quicker here now. For, uh, we only have like about 20 minutes left. So, you uh, you know, product pricing and, and pricing objectives. Some of your, you know, your, your objectives are you want to maximize profit, right? You want to price it in a way where you get most profits, overall profit, right? Achieve greater market share. You want more people to buy your product. Maximize sales. Build traffic, right? Like build people to come to your store or to your website, right? Match status quo pricing. What's the price? I'm going to match that price. Uh, cover the co you could, an objective could be just to cover your cost to survive for the time being, right? Create an image. Maybe you want to create an image that you are the low cost leader, or you want to create an image that you are the luxury brand. Right. Ensure affordability to all could be an objective, depending on the type of product you're selling, right? So here are some um, uh, strategies. So there's cost-based pricing, charging the price in relation to the cost of providing a good or a service. So you're looking at, this is my cost and I'm gonna mark it up by this amount. Let's sell sandwiches. How much is it gonna cost a sandwich shop to make a sandwich? Not including labor costs. Let's just look at, talk about the, the um, sandwich ingredients. I'd say a dollar. Because they buy everything in bulk, right? 
You need a little bit of meat, tomato, tomato, <laughs> lettuce, the bread, condiments, right? Let's say it costs a dollar. So we want to we want to sell it. We want to sell make it five times. Um, um, the, uh, we want to sell it at five times our cost. So you sell it at five dollars. So your uh, profit, your margin per unit is four dollars, right? So that's cost based prices. Advantages: it's easy to calculate and administer. Requires minimum information. All you need to know is what is it going to cost you to make, right? And what margin you want. Disadvantages: it in, ignores consumer price expect, expectations and competitors' prices. You got to keep that in mind as well, right? Especially if you're the new kid on the block. You're the new sandwich shop in town, right? You've got to see what, are, what other shops are charging. Provides little incentive to keep costs low, right? If you just look at your cost and then mark it up there, you're not going to worry about keeping your cost low or lowering your cost, which is actually a good strategy uh, to increase your margins, yeah. Demand-based pricing is pricing a good or service based on the demand of the product or its perceived values. Target costing is the esti estimates the value that, that, that uh, it provides um, to the consumer, right? Price discrimination is charging different prices for different customers. Is that legal? Can you charge different prices to different customers? Yes, you can. Yeah. Of course. That's crazy. But I tell you what, who does that? And it has nothing to do with uh, diversity of people. It's airlines, the time you buy the ticket, oh, yeah. hotel reservations, or the amount you buy. The more you buy, the lower your cost and things like that, right? Yeah. So it has nothing to do, that's, it's called price discrimination, but you're not discriminating based on the people's whatever dimensions, but you're you know, really based on um, when they, a lot of times when they buy, right? Prices change. You know, you, you sit on an airplane, you may have bought, bought your ticket for $500, the person next to you may have only paid $200. Uh, Competition-based pricing, you look at what the competition charges, right? Um, uh, and, you know, it depends on, when the, I think it was the second chapter where we talked about economic systems, market system, uh, you know, uh, free market system versus uh, government controlled systems, right? Uh, and depending on the products you're selling, there are different things you can do. I'm not gonna go, over all of these, but you know, perfectly competitive markets is very common with consumer products. Is when firms change the price equivalent to those all around uh, of all the other firms, they're about the same, right? And this is, happens a lot of consumer products that are not kind of like maybe grocery store products and things like that, right? Um, anyway, so make sure you read this on your own. Um, when launching a new product, there are two things you can do. You can do price skimming or price penetration. Price skimming is you set the price high and kind of skim the market and see how much you can charge, how much people are willing to pay for it. So try a really high price first, right? And if it takes, you keep that price. If not, you might have to lower it a bit and, 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 and try some other, um, you know, lower prices. Penetration prices is... Pricing is when you set the price low to penetrate the market as much as possible. Get as many people to buy it as quickly as possible. Yes. So my question is about price skimming. So sometimes last year we're trying to set up a business. Mm -hmm. And uh, the business partner calls. He said uh, it's better if we start, like what you said. I Hi. It, yeah. And uh, if we start low, then because of the industry, the people will, it's, uh, again, different people, right? They might talk to each other. That's how the business is set up. Yes. So I had an argument with him that it's better, don't you think, if we start high, small, like oh, low, mm -hmm, and then go up. But we ended up starting high. And so far, we've not had any like mishaps or anything. Yeah. But I I would like to think, because then I'm coming from a place of tech, and I'm thinking, like, if, I, if I'm starting a new tech business, a product, software, I've got to go low because of the competition or whatever, but I don't have a full grasp of like physical business and how that works. Yeah, well, that's, um, uh, again, it's, it's it's different. When you launch a new product, a, a lot of times there isn't a lot of competition, right? Uh, when there's competition, you're probably forced to start low, but when there's no competition, it's probably better to start high uh, because um, 
once you start low, you can't just say, okay, the market likes it. Now I can increase my prices. People are going to be upset and stop buying because you now set expectations of this is the price, this, uh, what I'm charging, this is what this should cost. This is the value you're getting. It's worth $10 versus $50 if you had started high, right? So again, it depends on the product, on the market, on the, the comp uh, uh, if there's competition or not, right? Yeah. Uh, other strategies to impact price, perce price perceptions is prestige or premium pricing. This is also often directly related to your brand, right? Psychological pricing, what is psychological pricing? It's when you do prices like $9.90 instead of $10. Then people think, oh, it's under 10 bucks, right? Things like that. So, uh, you know, playing with numbers like that, right? Loss leader pricing, you have a loss leader. What is a loss leader? You sell a product where you're actually losing money, but it brings people in, right? Costco does not. Costco chicken. Costco does, yeah. <laughs> Reference pricing. You look at, you know, other products and things like that, right? Oops, let's see. Um, I'm not going to go over the break-even analysis, uh, but just to explain what it is, break-even analysis is when you sell, when you, um, and we will cover this actually, um, your costs, uh, when you sell products, you have something, you have a line, when, when we go into accounting, in the accounting chapter, we'll cover it, but you have a line that says cost of goods sold. So that is how much, uh, let's talk the sandwich as an example. The cost of goods sold we determined in the sandwich, or I just said we didn't determine it, I said was $1 per sandwich. That's a cost of goods sold. If I sold 1,000 sandwiches, that means my co total cost of goods sold for that day was $1,000, right? But so that's the direct expense directly related to the product you're selling. But then you also have other expenses. You have your rent. Uh, so I get $4 per sandwich. If I sell a thousand sandwiches, how much do I have left? I made $5,000. I have $4,000 left. I can now use that $4,000 to cover my other expenses, my rent, my employees, my insurance, my utility bills, um, administrative expenses, whatever. Um, so um, if my other expenses for that period is $4,000, I broke even. I didn't lose money, but I also didn't make a profit. But that's what this break-even analysis does, right? So look at it, read it. Um, I, I think there might be a video online, but um, I can maybe go through the motions when we talk about accounting. I can show you how this uh, where it's, it's actually a very simple, very simple equation. Yes. Uh, does break even also kind of work in, I think I've heard it before, in the stocks market, like uh, trading? Yeah. Okay. Uh, anywhere. It can work anywhere. Yeah. With anything you buy or sell, right? Okay, that's it. Let me go ahead and stop the recording.